decision who would help me with my decisions who would help me if i didn't know what to do if i'm if i'm overwhelmed who would help me if i don't have god in my life without god in my life who would protect my kids who would keep my car from from being in an accident who would come and deliver me from judgment day name Lord praise is what I do praise is in my mouth praise is in my mind praise is in my soul praise is in my heart praise is what I do I live a life of praising my king it is my culture it is my heritage it is my history it is my future it is my prophecy to continue to praise my God to praise my king if I don't praise him who gonna praise him I can't expect another nation to praise him. I can't expect another person to praise him. Just because there's hard times and I, that means I shouldn't praise him. Everybody has hard times. But if I have a hard time and I still praise my God when he's looking down on the earth and he sees two people going through hard times and one is complaining and one is praising, which one do you think he's going to bless? Which one do you Amen. think is going to please him? It's always going to be the praiser that gets God's attention because God dwells in the midst of praise. I'm going to change my message if I don't stop. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise is just what I do. Can you make that a declaration for the rest of this year? That through the hard times, through tribulation, through everything that you're going through, even if you get fired on your God, thank God for the job that you, the, for the time that you had on that job, and thank God for the job that's coming. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We bless your holy name, Jesus. Thank you all for coming. I really do appreciate you. Tonight, I want to ask you a series of questions. If you have Samsung Notes, if you have Apple Notes, whatever Apple people use, I want you to write these questions down because I want to see the answer to these questions. When the Lord returns, I want you to know that people will be still eating, drinking. They will still be marrying, planning future events. This is exactly what happened until the exact moment that Noah entered into the ark. It would be what the world will consider a normal day like today today was a normal day or like tomorrow what will you be doing this is my first question what will you be doing what actions will you be taking what exactly will you be doing one hour before the lord returns what will you be doing i want to be found serving him i want to be found keeping the covenant i don't want to be trying to get ready trying to please my flesh searching for entertainment i want to be ready i don't want to be trying to get ready i want to be ready it's too late in the hour it's 2023 have you seen the news there are wars and rumors of wars what percentage of time do we have left luke 17 36 says two men shall be in the field one shall be taken and the other left and the disciples answered and said unto him where did you catch that? Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, that's where the vultures will be gathered together. Jeremiah 8, 7 says, Yeah, the stork that flies in the sky knows of her migration. And the turtle dove and the crane and the swallow, they know when it's time to go. But my people, God's people, don't know the judgment of the Lord. We can see here the way it's worded. We can tell that God's people, if anybody, the way this is worded, we can tell that God's people should be the people that know when it's time to move. Amen. Animals naturally can figure this out. They can figure out naturally when it's time to migrate. They can read the signs of the time. They can tell the season is changing. But for some reason, God's people don't know when judgment day is coming. God's people don't know when their God is going to return. The Lord does not want to come and catch us off guard and try to gather the minimum amount of people. God loves his people. That's why in addition to him warning us that he's coming back soon, he's giving us the signs so we will know it's time. This is the reason he said, watch therefore. That means pay attention. Because you don't know the hour that your God is coming back. Well, if we don't know the hour, we have a problem. That's why we have to be ready and not be getting ready. The disciples, they, this, it was strange that they didn't ask what you or me would have asked. I want to know when. But they asked him where. Do you see that? 
Where? He told them that there would be two people in the field and one would be taken, there would be two men in the bed, one would be taken, and they said, where? They never asked when. He said, wherever you see the vultures hovering overhead, they're waiting on something to die. When you see vultures gathering, they're gathering because some animal is dead. God wants us to know the signs of the time. He wants us to pay attention to what's going on around us so we will know it's time to be ready and not be found getting ready. Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, I paid attention. I heard. I heard. But they didn't speak right. No man, not one of them repented of his wickedness. They said, what did I do? Everybody turned back to their normal sinful life after he preached a message to him. The same way a horse rushes into battle. Is it possible to talk someone out of backsliding? Thank you for your answer, sweetie. Is it too late? Is there any hope for a person that, is the, that has their mind set up to walk away from God and turn back to their sins and not know, like she just said, not know that they can see God in peace or accept his peacefulness? Is it possible to convince somebody that gave their life to God? Is it possible to convince them not to do something that they know is a sin? Is that possible? These are the questions that I want you all to answer for me. Did you know if you're lukewarm, God will spew you out? Jeremiah asks, why then is this people of Jerusalem, specific people, why does the saints of God slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? He's asking, why do God's people keep turning back to sin? He said they hold tight to deceit. That means they really think they can get away with this. They refuse to return back to God. This is why Jeremiah is considered a weeping prophet because he feels, he feels what the, the pain that God feels when he's talking to these people, when he's talking to Israelites. They, they harden their heart. They don't want to turn back to God and they keep doing the same thing over and over. And God keeps punishing them over and over. And he's like, why are you continuously backsliding? Isaiah, another prophet, he picks it up and he says, because of that, this is what the Lord is saying to the prophet Isaiah. I'm going to number you to the sword. And ye shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, you didn't answer. When I spoke, you didn't hear. But you did evil before my eyes. And you chose the things that I didn't like. I will also choose their delusions. And I will bring their fears upon them. Why? Because when I called, nobody answered. When I spoke, they didn't hear. But they did evil before my eyes and they chose to do the things that I didn't delight in. In Hebrews it says, for if we sin willfully, that means yielding to your free will. If we sin on purpose, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. With all the resources God has given you, he's given you pastors according to his heart and teachers, and his word, and worship, and the Holy Ghost, and conviction, and a comforter. God says, I'm saving you, and I expect you to stay saved. Sin is bad. I wish there was another way to put emphasis on bad, because sin is a problem. Sin is the worst thing on earth. Sin itself is what brought death into the world. It made God have to be murdered on a tree. But God in his mercy, he gave us a remedy for sin. The major problem on earth has a solution. He that covers his sin shall not prosper. But whosoever confesses and turns away from his sin shall have mercy. Once again, we see the Bible saying, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. To forgive us of our sins. That's good news. Somebody ought to do that right now. Tell God what you did. Tell him you're sorry. And determine in your heart. You'll never do it again. That's so easy. He said he's faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Burning sage can't cleanse you. Amen. Tarot card readers, they can't take away your unrighteousness. Psychics can't forgive you. Confess to God. Talk. To God, he's faithful 
and he specializes in saving souls. This is the God we serve. This is the God we're expecting. This is the God we're looking for. I want an audience with the people that backslides one hour before the Lord comes. The ones that backslide right before the Lord comes, I want to talk to them. I promise you one hour afterwards, they'll tell you it wasn't worth it. If it was a month later, they'll tell you the same thing. If they backslide last year and they get left behind this year, it'll be devastating to know it wasn't worth it. Who will be the most overwhelmed? This is another question. Who will be the most devastated when the Lord returns and they're not ready? That guy that thinks it's safe to sin? Got away with it last time. Or will it be that person that says, y'all doing too much. It don't take all that. Will it be the atheist or the agnostic? Or will it be Demas, a backslider? Y'all know who Demas is? Demas was a minister. He worked closely with the Apostle Paul. There are people that got saved because of Demas. Now they saved and he not. The money that you donated, Demas, the time that you spent, Demas, is all gone. What about the people that invested in you, Demas? Teachers, preachers, what about the people that laid hands on you, Demas? How did you end up backsliding? How do you end up like Demas? How does that start? Nobody wakes up after being in the presence of the Lord and decides, you know what, I'm out of here. This was a process that you ignored. So you stopped coming. Remember when you stopped praising him? You know, you stopped watching. I'll watch later. Now you're lukewarm. The problem with being lukewarm is you don't know it. You got, you got real close to your unsaved friends, didn't you? You found your coworkers' conversations interesting. You start saying, well, nothing wrong with this, or that ain't a sin. When you used to say, I'm going to shun the very appearance of sin. Your conversations are no longer with you leading and looking for opportunities to testify. When you really say, when you first got saved, you're listening to the conversation, but you're looking for opportunity to tell them about your God, to tell them how good God is, to tell them about the Holy Ghost, to tell them about your church and your pastor. But now you just try to fit in. There was a time when Demas wasn't cold because Demas was working in a ministry when Paul wrote to the people of Coloss, for example. They knew Demas by first name. That shows you how hard he was working in the ministry. And I got a side note. How come the true workers of the gospel, they, how come these, the true workers of the gospel didn't have goofy titles? They called Paul, Paul. They called Peter, Peter. Anyway, in another letter to the Colossians, Paul is letting the people know, hey, hey, Demas said, praise the Lord. That's what it's saying right here in, in Colossians 4, 14. They knew who Demas was because Demas was a hard worker. Demas was work with, taught with uh, Apostle Paul Many a times, traveling all over the, the, uh, the Fertile Crescent with Apostle Paul. But a short time later, you can hear the pain in Paul's pen. It wasn't that much later. You hear the pain in his pen as he announces the very worst news for a saint. He says, Demas has forsaken me. He gone. What? In 2 Timothy 4.10, that's what it says. For Demas has forsaken me. How? He was just working in the ministry. He was just traveling and helping Paul. Next, Paul gives a reason for this. He says he loved this present world. What does he mean present world? What other world is there? Don't you want to see the next world that the Bible prophesied about? Notice Paul isn't looking for Demas. Here's the next question. Did Demas go to hell? Paul never asked, where's Demas? I know the countries he went to, but he never asked, have you seen him? Who looks for a backslider? Were you ever part of a group that sought out and looked for backsliders? You see Demas working in a ministry, which isn't for everybody, because ministry can burn you out. If you don't have a burden to see soul saved, you have not been called. Ministry is not for everybody. Can you imagine working with the Apostle Paul? He wrote two thirds of the New Testament. This guy killed people. He held the garments for men that stoned Deacon Stephen to death. He talked to God directly from the sky. Can you imagine working with him? Demas didn't know that his actions would be recorded for everybody to see. Do you know what you do today will be written for everybody else to see? We're walking epistles. You're a walking letter. 
Where is Demas? He saw somebody get healed. He saw lots of people get healed. He saw people get demons cast out of them. Paul has to deal with another person that has a demon possessed. Where's Demas? I need his help. I just start, Apostle Paul just started a new ministry in another city somewhere. Where's Demas? I need help with this new, this is what me and him do. Where is he? We don't hear anything else about Demas. We don't see anywhere where he made it back. Where did this start? It started being in the flesh. It started being lukewarm. It started the first time you missed a service and you didn't feel bad. You didn't feel convicted. Imagine Demas told Paul, hey, Paul, I can't make this one. Okay, I'll catch you on the next one. Then something else takes your attention. This is what happens. Little by little, short time after short time, more and more. You give God glory, you work hard in the ministry, and in a little time, you lose interest because you like worldliness. Imagine you lose salvation over a man. Over that one song that you got in your spirit. That one movie that forces images into your subconscious. That, that one post that you just had to click on anyway. Where exactly does it start? People that shoot up, they didn't start off with a needle in their vein. You get comfortable with a cigarette, then weed. Then you go from weed occasionally to weed daily. You drink every day? What was your very first cuss word in your life? Look at the words you use now, potty mouth. If you didn't know better, playing with sin is a very bad idea. It's just bad. It's a bad idea. If you're saved, you're eating your own vomit. That's what playing with sin is. You can please God. You can avoid temptation. You can live holy. You can shun the very appearance of evil. You don't have to lie. You don't have to cheat. You can live without sex. You can stop smoking. You can live without anything that will cause you to be like Demas. Where is Demas today? Is he in heaven? When he stands before the Lord, will he say, Lord, I used to live holy. Let me in. I used to win souls for you. I used to flow in the anointing, God. So let me in. I don't know why we turn our back on backsliders. I don't know why we feel some type of way if somebody gets caught back up in sin. The Bible says, brothers, if any of you do error from the, from the truth, that means this is something that doesn't have to happen. Because the word if means something. If any of you error from the truth and one of you convert him, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death. Your soul can die and shall hide a multitude of sins. Do you know what you will be doing when you convince somebody not to be worldly? What exactly are you doing when you convince somebody not to be carnal? You're saving a soul. You're saving a soul from hell. If you see me in carnality, if you see me involved in worldliness, please help me because I want my soul to live. It's a good thing if you can talk somebody out of backsliding. It's a real friend that will try to help somebody traverse this labyrinth called life. On my life journey, I want to help somebody's soul escape death. And I'm not going to talk about your sins. I'm not going to run your name through the ground. I'm not going to tell everybody your business. I just want to see you restored. That's what a real friend does. And I'm going to tell you, hey, stay away from that. Because that will hurt you. And that will pull you away from God. And that will make you lukewarm. And that will make you like Demas. If this was you. If you were once close to God. Remember how we were when we first got saved? Remember how much you read your Bible back then? How you loved to be in his presence? How you seek for him. Now you're dealing with the consequences of sin. But can you point out where it started? Because the Bible says this is what you have to do. It says, remember, therefore, from when you have fallen. Remember from that point. Go back and find where that point was when you became carnal. When you began accepting worldliness. Go back and find that point and repent. Think about the moment you stop feeling God move inside your soul. Think about the first full day that you didn't feel his warm embrace. Think about the first time you thought, man, I haven't spoken tongues in a while. 
God said, go back and do the first works. Do what you did in the beginning. Follow hard after him. Desperately chase him. He says, or else I will come unto you quickly and I will remove your candlestick out of this place. Except you repent. Look how merciful God is. He's allowing us to get away with our sins. He's allowing you to just get away with it. All we got to do is repent. God is in control of everything that happens, whether it's good or whether it's bad. He's a master. God says, I'm going to wait until you had enough because we humans need pain to cause us to migrate. Unlike birds in the sky, we need pain to move. God will do nothing about your situation until you acknowledge the source. You, me, you sinned, you pulled away from God and you're not doing his will. That's why he said, I will go, God, and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. When it gets really bad for them, in their affliction, that's when they're going to seek me early. When things are out of control, they'll come to me. Thus said the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, the Holy Lord of Israel. When you shall turn and bitterly cry, then you shall be saved. And you will know where you was when you trusted in vanities. Then your stubbornness became worthless and you still wouldn't listen. God, saints of God, those of you who are listening to me, God wants to welcome you home. That's the message of the prodigal son. There is hope today. There's no reason for you to live without knowing your calling and your election is sure. I don't want to live without God in my life. Who would direct my path? Who would help me with my decisions? Who would help me if I didn't know what to do? If I'm, if I'm overwhelmed, who would help me if I don't have God in my life? Without God in my life, who would protect my kids? Who would keep my car from, from being in an accident? Who would come and deliver me from judgment day? I'm so glad I made a firm decision, a firm, hard decision to give my life to God and bury my old life. So glad I didn't end up like Demas. Thank you, Jesus. Lost in the world. Died in sin. Nobody looking for you. You had the keys to eternal life, dude. You had a chance to be with God forever. Demas, you should have just came back home. If you're out in the world today, I want to welcome you back home. Whoever's listening to me, I want to tell you it's okay to come back home. But Elimus, the sorcerer, he interfered. And he urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Paul were saying. Thank you for this. He was trying to keep the governor from believing the demon, the devil, a woman, a kid, a job, a circumstance, situations, problems try to turn you away. That's the job of this world system to turn you away. But the works that you do, the time that you put in, the time that you put in for God is the only thing that will last. Do you remember when God told Moses to put a snake on a cross? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And if you've been bitten by a snake, you, all you have to do is look up at it and you'll live. That's the symbol you see on the ambulance today, right? When Hezekiah became king, he removed all of the shrines. He removed all the illegal places to worship idols. He broke images. He cut down the memorial stones for the false gods. And he broke into pieces that same serpent, the same exact one that Moses had. Why did he break it? Guess why he broke it? Because the children of Israel were worshiping it, worshiping it and burning incense to it. They wouldn't look up at it, but we we're going to worship it, burn incense to it. 25-year-old King Hezekiah, he remained faithful to the Lord. He never stopped following him, but he kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. He kept the entire commandments of the Torah. Hezekiah is in contrast to Demas. The complete opposite of Demas. And I want to end my life with this same testimony of Hezekiah. I want my testimony at the end of my life to be, I kept the commandments of the Lord. The best thing to have written on your tombstone or the best thing you can put on my tombstone, he was faithful all the way until he died. He didn't depart from the faith. He didn't backslide. He didn't waver. Here lies a man waiting on the return of the Lord. Some years later, Hezekiah was terminally ill, sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, This is what the Lord said, Hezekiah, 
set your house in order, you are not going to recover. You are not going to make it out of this. You are going to die. Has he heard this? King Hezekiah. I'm calling him Hezzy. He heard the man of God. He heard him say the most dreadful words in his lifetime. It's, it's always bad news to hear somebody is going to die. It's horrible. But to hear the news that you're going to die? He turned his face to the wall. And he prayed like you and I would pray if we was in hospice. But in 2 Kings 20 verse 4 it says, And it came to pass, before the prophet Isaiah made it past the front yard, the Lord came to Isaiah and said, Go back! Go tell Hezi, the captain of my people. Tell him, I said, tell him the Lord said, Thus said the Lord, the God of David, thy father. I said, I said, okay, God, what do you want me to tell him? Tell him, I have heard your prayer. Can you imagine God saying, oh, God, help me today, Jesus. Can you imagine praying and God saying, I know you've had some sleepless nights. I know your pillow is wet with tears. I know you've been pacing the floor all night long trying to figure out what to do. But I come to tell you, I heard you. Thank you, Jesus. I don't care what God's response will be. I don't care if he even fix it. He heard me. Thank you, Jesus. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Your servant beckons for thee. Help me, Jesus. You mean to tell me, little old me, good for nothing, me, the God of the universe can hear when I call him? What do I have to worry about? What do I have to fear? God heard me. God said, go back, go back and tell him. Go tell Hezzy. I've seen your tears. Covenant servants, listen to me. Don't give up praying. Don't stop fasting. Don't think your sacrifices are in vain. Pray till God hears you. Isaiah said, go tell Hezzy. Listen carefully. Tell him I'm going to heal you. I'm going to do what the doctors cannot do. I'm going to move and blow your mind. Hold on a little while longer. God will make a way out of no way. How he's going to do it, I don't know, but he's going to do it somehow. God said on the third day, you're going to go into the house of the Lord. God is saying, oh, I need the saints to see you. I need to get some glory. God says, look, I just raised a man from hospice. Yes, Hezekiah was supposed to die. That's what the prophet said out of his mouth. But something happened. What happened? Why did the king, I mean, why did the prophet have to go back? In 2 Kings 20 verse 2, he says, then he turned his face to the wall and prayed. That's it. What could he have possibly said to get God to change his mind? Let's listen to his prayer. He said, I beg you, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before you in truth and with a wicked heart. No, it says with a perfect heart. He says, and I have done that which is good in thy sight. That's all he said. He didn't say, I beg you not to let me die. He said, I beg you to remember I lived holy. I kept the commandments. He said, remember, I did good. That's all he wanted God to remember. That's why God said, go back. Because what you do for God matters. He, you, you destroyed idols in your life. You warred against your flesh. You shunned friends that was wicked. You stayed away from places that you wanted to go. What if Hezekiah had nothing to turn to the wall and say? Here's the revelation. God didn't forget what Hezekiah did for him. And God didn't need to be reminded. He got Hezekiah needed to know why God is going to add 15 years to your life. Hezekiah needed to know that it was because you had a perfect heart. Hezekiah needed to know that because I walked in the truth and I've done that which was good, so now you know, Hezekiah, what it takes to please God. Now that you know what's necessary, don't let anybody trick you into thinking you don't have to live holy. Notice he didn't ask him for anything. He just said, Lord, I beg you to remember Hallelujah. Can you say that? Can you, can you go over your life and, and tell God, remember these things that I did for you? If you don't, if you can't, start now. Start working in the vineyard. Start doing things for God now. Start getting a perfect heart. Start working in, 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 in the ministry and doing whatever you have to do. Start doing things that, that's pleasing to God. Remember God that I wasn't wishy-washy. Remember I didn't straddle the fence, God. Remember I sacrificed I sacrifice to follow you. In your final hours, do you give up? When things are not working out, do you walk away from the faith? Do you turn your back to sin and a lifestyle 
that God hates? Are you in constant memory? Are you thinking about serving God? I, me, I want to work so hard in the vineyard that I can say to God, God, can you please remember those times when I sang to you even though I can't sing? Can you please, God, remember those people that I told about you? Do, God, do you remember how I didn't complain sometimes, but I praised you instead? When the world was going in one direction, God, I stood up for holiness. God, there were so many times I told my flesh no. There were so many times I wrestled with my flesh to make sure I don't do anything that will hurt you. I don't want to be like Demas. Here and then there. Hot, but then lukewarm. Living for you, but taken away by the pleasures of this world. And now, nobody knows where he is. I want to be sure that I did the best I could to serve my king. It's this current world system that got you down, not God. It's your own proclivities that got you drowning in drama and toxic situations, not God. It's your own heart's desire and your lack of self-control that got you in these dilemmas, not God. So stop blaming him and come back home. We welcome you back home. Come back home because this is the final call. There's so much here for you. There's so much in holiness for you. Listen, you'll get to see all the times that God protected you. We talked about this, Nikki. You will learn who your true enemies were. You will never have pain or sorrow again. When the Lord returns, you won't have bills, stress, anxiety, temptation. Hold on! A little while longer, you're going to see the salvation of the Lord. You caught up in politics. You caught up in a worldly system where you try to flow with the crowd instead of swimming against the current. Push through the crowd. You, you, you're trying to fit in a system that's not created for you. You weren't sent here for this. What is your purpose? Who is your destiny tied to? Or why are you with someone who you, you know sure well God didn't ordain? God didn't send you that person. If he did, prove it. The pain that you endured in your life, everything that you've ever went through, is proof that God is with you. You tried to take yourself out. God wouldn't let you. You made a mess and you don't know how to clean it up. If you're in too deep and don't know how to get out, God is calling you. He's so merciful. He's giving you another chance. I know the pastor hurt you. I know church members were mean. God still wants you. But well, why he let it happen? Because God gave men free will. And free will means men have the freedom or the free will to hurt people. And it's, it's sad. And it's unfortunate that somebody didn't see the value in you because you are precious. And it might take you the rest of your life to get where God wants you to be. But you can start the journey slowly today, one step at a time. God has a day set aside for that person that hurt you. Trust me. Everybody that did something to you, trust me, the day of vengeance is coming for them. He said, God is a God that loves judgment. His judgment is worse than anything you could have done to that person. Give him a chance. Stop trying to fix your life and accept the life God has for you. God is trying to save you. God is trying to deliver you. God is trying to give you another chance. You can do this. You can live holy. You can ask God for one more chance. Hallelujah. God will love you. God will, hurt, will not hurt you. God is here for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.